I'm sorry, I didn't realize that. I, well, yeah. Um, so this is, I think, the only thing of this division stage. Pretty much everything else. Well, back then you did an expensive engineer. Today, any undergraduate student can program this for you. The robots look much nicer. We have way more computation. We have way more sensing. But the big question remains open: Why don't we have such robots? And that obviously brings us to the inverse of that question. That is not the question of why don't we have such robots, but where actually have robots been successful? And well, as somebody coming from Germany, I obviously say in car industry, we wouldn't produce any cars in Germany without robots. And I'm pretty sure the same can be said about the United States or any other first world country. Um, the accuracy of well, 150 micrometers in anything from spray painting to, uh, um, <clears throat> to soldering and so on, that is really needed there. And the factories are extremely well automated, but they're also perfectly done so that nothing can go wrong and that there is no uncertainty whatsoever left. Then you look at the other two examples. Well, the lawnmower, which typically has a wire in the ground, and or the Roomba, well, which typically makes all of us rearrange our furniture in the moment where we buy one so that it doesn't get stuck under the sofa. So where have they been successful? Well, always, whenever we adapt the tasks to the robots. What should we do be doing instead? Well, we should be adapting the robots to the task. And I think that's, um, that's the key, key message. But um, a few years ago, this was kind of, uh, was kind of catharic, would have been kind of catharic. But today, obviously, everybody knows all the successes of well, reinforcement learning, doing anything from the night where in the 90s we already played TDGAM, um, very successful against human beings at the master level, the Atari games, Go, AI Gym, um, or the, uh, the, Q, the Rubik's Cube, the, all the cube juggling things. They should all well, have, have persuaded, persuaded most of the world today that, well, we should be doing reinforcement learning. Or should we? Well, let's have a look. Well, here's a very, very old experiment. This was my, uh, my first, uh, okay, okay, wait, let me, let me, sorry, I, I wanted to do one part before. So first of all, whenever you do reinforcement learning, you have to compare yourself to the classical engineer. And the classical engineer, robot engineer is really, really good at his job. If you can't do something which looks, well, more pretty for locomotion than what a good engineer can produce, which doesn't do the job as well as at least the one your undergraduate student can hack up, then, well, obviously you shouldn't be doing learning in the first place. And it turns out that this is still incredibly hard at today's stage with most of today's algorithms, even when you have a lot of data. Then, of course, data is expensive. So the thing we can say in language, the thing we can say in computer vision, where people typically have, well, a gigantic amount of data, and then, which is typically more than all the situations they'll ever encounter. Well, that is not the case in robotics. This year was my first robot reinforcement learning experiment ever. And it required, I think, that I had to bend down and pick up the balls about 6,000 times. I still feel the back pain. Um, several decades on. So data is expensive and that will not change, especially as we are living in an open world where, well, there's always too little data in robotics, which is very different from natural language processing, where the world we're living in is, is limited in the end by the text we have seen from other people. So when you say this to a, data is expensive, you say this to a, somebody core from computer science who has never been closer than a meter to a robot, they will directly say, oh, you should just get a simulator and be done with it. But that's also a terrible statement to make, right? If you have a good simulator, which is so good that you should be doing all your learning in it, well, then you don't need learning anymore. You can do planning and we all know planning actually is something which works extremely well when it works, when the model is good enough. And um, the time for learning is then, except maybe for compression of plans, really not there when you have a good enough robot simulator. Then any true roboticist knows things break. And if you haven't broken your robot, you're not a roboticist. 
That's a simple fact. I don't think I need to preach this to any of you. And then there come the subtle things. And, and I think it's, it's one of the most interesting things you can do is to talk to human motor scientists. And um, well, one of the, well, one of the really uh, most interesting guys to talk to was actually John Milton, who was uh, pretty also in the Northern Northwest United States. And um, he basically has all of these statements like how little golf generalizes to hockey and how well that we can't actually share these tasks as we do this in computer vision so easily because except for simple hand-eye motor controls and some basic models, generalization is much more difficult um, for well interesting movement. And finally, we want the learning algorithms to work in real time, which obviously pushes computation in a totally different manner and um, imposes gigantic communication, energy and computation limits um, since we want, well, then we want to have all that data in there in real time. So with other words, just saying out of the box, now reinforcement learning works great in simulators, machine learning has solved so many tasks, let's, let's just apply this to robotics is up to today, not a straightforward answer. So, Therefore, kind of the core of my talk today is that I really want to stress if a lesson which I have learned, but which I think will remain true in robot reinforcement learning, no matter what advances we'll actually make in black box reinforcement learning, or in, in, and no matter what advances we make in other parts of, of AI where we apply reinforcement learning. And that is that we really need robotics inductive biases in robot reinforcement learning. So what is an inductive bias? Well, an inductive bias allows a learning algorithm to prioritize one solution or interpretation over another, independent of the observed data. Inductive biases can express assumptions about either the data generating process or the space of solutions. And I think the big two big questions that arise from that are, well, what inductive biases does robotics offer and how can we actually use them for improving robot reinforcement learning? Now, I should say I, we have found about 30 inductive biases. I'm only going to talk about seven of them. And they also give us the outline of this talk. So let me start right away. And let me start with the one thing which everybody threw at me when I told them um, well, more than 15 years back, I want to get into robot reinforcement learning. Since pretty much everybody said to me, you shouldn't do this, imitation learning will do it. And I mean, the amazing results in imitation learning, right? And since imitation learning is generically an easier problem than reinforcement learning. It's not quite supervised learning, but it's, it's so much closer to supervised learning that you can do a lot with off the shelf algorithms. And in fact, it's, it's, it's really, it's quite a humbling lesson in history when you try to travel down to who did imitation learning first, because when you take this objective and you write it slightly differently, so the objective of being close to the data distribution with your policy, which is a distribution of actions given the state and the resulting state distribution, that this objective actually gives you already algorithms from the 1960s from Michi and Chambers, who were among the first um, to actually do already behavioral cloning. So mutation learning is actually not so much such a, well, well, not such a new, it was not such a new idea at all. And it was just mainly popularized then really in the nineties by people like Claude Semmet who could show that, that the teacher, that the student could be better than the teacher for the simple effects of cleanup of that regularization itself can actually yield a better policy from data than what the teacher ever showed the student. Obviously that has a few priors in there, like for example, smoothness as well. And it's only very recently that um, people realized that if you wanna do better imitation, that you obviously need to bring in more knowledge about the system. So for example, the propagation of the state distribution mu, and it, that actually, wasn't formal, wasn't done formally up to about 10 years ago, where, for example, Peter Englert had showed that this would give you a very, very effective learning problem. And um, well, in the dual to that, or actually the primal to be precise, was inverse reinforcement learning, which turns out to be actually be the more complex version 
of this program. You can also solve this, of course, for, for minimal physics, in which case you get things like, for example, motor primitives, which are very effective um, representations then for learning and give you very effective learning problems. I really want to highlight one thing, which especially in the US is, is, is frequently forgotten. Inverse reinforcement learning is actually the less effective version of this program because you have quadratically many constraints while you would only have linearly many constraints um, in, the, in the dual up there. And therefore you can get stuck in local minima and such kind of things much, much more frequently. For us, this worked really well. For example, here for learning a forehand from just six demonstrations and um, where, every, where it based directly learns from camera input to, um, to well, uh, the movement of the robot and against the ball gun on the um, left side of the table it actually got a I think 99.7 heaven of the balls return rate and not only when you place well when you make it move much more than it shows in this video. So now why should we do a reinforcement learning if imitation is so good? Well all of us know, you know in the, when you learn a sport like tennis, tennis teacher takes you by the hand, shows you forehand, shows you backhand, and then it still takes you 300 strikes before you get the first ball over the net. So clearly we need to do reinforcement learning and reinforcement learning is annoying because here we have typically the reward and we are losing this notion of data which we have in imitation learning. So there is, is no natural way of even when you bring in the constraints as people would do, for example, in, in reinforcement learning by linear programming, even if you have the constraints, there is actually no data in here. And the dual, which is the value function based formulation of reinforcement learning, again, doesn't have a notion of data in there. And if you use the Bellman's principle of optimality and do decoding thing via the so-called Bellman equation, uh, well, you would still not get any form of data in there. So you have to actually make up that this becomes a data generating problem. So either by saying you're using data to approximate value functions or by just working with the policy gradients and you're automatically quite, yeah, automatically limited in that respect. And that actually is a very worrisome thing. However, if you use, if you have no natural notion of data, and you use the insight from before that in imitation learning, we wanted to stay close to training data. Obviously in reinforcement learning, we should ideally also stay close to the data we have and not go somewhere crazily into your space. So that brings us to the insight that if you put these two programs together, you just move the objective from imitation learning down into the constraint in as a constraint on the boundary of information loss, well, then you get a program which actually can be solved analytically. So it gives you close form formulations for your controllers. And um, in addition, a, param in con a convex, if you have a linear policies, a convex optimization problem. And we figured this out actually really relatively early. And it turns out that um, as Pukrit already so nicely mentioned, this actually has been the foundation for nearly all of the, the reinforcement learning algorithms, which in recent times have been so in, incredibly successful. Not that we got much credit for that, but this is now mainly known under the name entropy regularizations. And even things which we did much earlier, which when I worked for example, natural actor critic, these all turned to be out to be just linear approximations. And the algorithms you get from this are in working incredibly well. So this is Kai Plöger, he was a master student at that point in my uh, group. He's now a PhD student. He can juggle up to seven balls by us, both by himself and his, and he can make this, make our robots do this. So this was his master's thesis. And I told him, well, I'll hire you as a PhD student after you showed this to me. And I, and I said, but only if until Monday, was it supposed to be a joke? If until Monday, you can make two arms juggle with the, um, with the balls and okay, well now this, this shows the, the progress of juggling over rollouts over the single arm. You have to wait for a moment until, this is actually still the master's thesis. It can juggle with one arm for 30, for 30 minutes or more. 
The only problem is the overheating of the buried WAM, uh, which occasionally happens. That's why we, well, we don't do more than 30 minutes. Repair, well, repairing a WAM isn't fun, let's put it this way. For the ones of you who haven't done it, you know what I'm saying. Um, and um, here you see basically, it's, these are the separate rollouts. Um, and um, how it becomes better and better, and it really can well, juggle for a very, very long time. And this was the result he showed me on Monday, uh, returning my joke with a much better answer. Um, so he, he, took, he, he actually apologized. He said he can only make it, it juggle three balls and explained to me that juggling four balls would actually have been easier, but he had aimed for five. It's four balls you can do by having the two arms being basically separate and running the same policy, largely independent from each other. Um, and um, he can, he, his dream PhD is actually he wants to reach the theoretical maximum of balls, which is 16 balls. Um, <laughs> But um, don't don't keep your, uh, your get your hopes up. I think the ceiling will be the limit, um, since juggling is actually quite constraining. Yes. So we we have um, several cameras there, and we have for training. We typically always use still uh, Vicon marker based is, um, vision systems because it's just so much more reliable. Um, in the um, in interestingly, the policy initially uses feedback. And the better it becomes, the less feedback it uses. And when it converges, it's, it's largely open loop. Um, on this system, he now has a system where it, it where he basically gives it, it only vision for learning. And because of the noise in there, the feedback components are and at some don't atrophy. They don't. The learning system doesn't learn to destroy all feedback. Because when, when you have good sensing, well, feed, and the sen then the sensing can only introduce noise is and can only make things worse. But if you basically, uh, and you want to well, learn, it, learn it away, well, if you, the sensing during your learning process is, is, is never so good that you become really super good at your task, then the feedback control stays on. Uh, Mitsu Kawato told me at some point that this a similar idea is behind feedback error learning control, which is a model of, of human cerebellar learning for, um, for control. So it seems to be somewhat reasonable. So this gives you, first of all, our first inductive bias. Always stay close to your training data. Um, you get better algorithms that way, and you can actually, well, learn new things like learning to juggle from a reasonable amount of robot interaction time. And we even figured out that a lot of algorithms we've done in between like EM-based learning then can actually be seen as instantiations of, of this program, which I showed you. you know, so now let me get to the next inductive bias. And again, let me start with the, with the bon mot. Um, whenever you talk to, especially to a human movement scientist, they'll tell you that human movement is composed only of strokes and rhythmic behavior. And for a roboticist, this makes also sense since we are, we are either talking about point to point movements or about some kind of oscillatory motion. And um, well, that's precisely what we would like to actually always extract. But I think what's, and that gives us, of course, something very similar already, like similar to symbols. And um, the idea we have been pursuing for a very long time is that we always can start with one infinitely long trajectory, not infinitely, one very long trajectory and turn this trajectory right away into one policy. Now that's obviously again, closer to imitation learning. And you can do this in table tennis. We can do this in all kinds of manipulation tasks. And here you can see this very nicely. This is one great, huge gray trajectory. And here are two symbols, um, which, it which it actually learned from this. So the, the backhand and the forehand, as well as two kind of, well, waiting postures. Uh, so four symbols altogether. Once you have this, well, the way you get this is that you take the demonstration or if it's several demonstrations, you over segment them. And then you're really trying to build up a movement primitive library, which by, by always joining these, these primitives and then getting a distribution over, well, put all the potential trajectories you would generate by imitation learning. 
from this, well, you can actually then also get, well, the next inductive bias that we should could actually get a modular policy which enables us to do the one thing which we in robotics would so much like to have of us from, the, from learning so that we have something which actually enables composition. So the second inductive bias, you, you should use, we should always try to create and use a modular structure for composition. Now, the naive way to continue from here is to say, okay, well, let's be to, let's do what Rich Sutton, for example, introduced in, um, in reinforcement learning to say that, oh, you want to have something called options in hybrid control. There's also a similar thing with the symbols. So you would want to have something with a gating network, which enables us to activate many different sub policies. I just had a fun discussion with Sang Bei, who basically thinks about reflexes being activated in an incredibly similar uh, fashion I found. So um, I think we, we all think alike here. But, and when you insert this again into our, into our program, well, initially this seems like a trivial thing to do, right? You add an O everywhere where there's a red O now, and voila, you should be done. And in fact, it works initially. So here we have we had to add a lot of, at that point, we were looking into a selection of strokes and selection of strokes includes the problem that you have to incorporate the opponent because otherwise with a buried wham and a two kilogram wrist, you can't go to the other side of the table fast enough, um, at least not without either destroying the robot or the table once in a while. And so we are tracking the human, uh, we're giving features on the human. So there's seven cameras look, um, looking at ball and, and human altogether. And um, the selection, the learning system learns very fast to select the strokes based on where the how the human is striking the ball and um, then just uses the ball only during the actual execution of the stroke. However, while this worked well for table tennis, being naive is never a good thing. And one thing we figured out very soon was that you can create cases where this naivety really bit us as badly. And um, one of them is when you have two solutions, which are really good, so one here and one here. And initially your, your sub policies can span both of these situations. What you see here is that, well, in this case, even this totally trivial case, they don't separate in some cases and we get stuck in a local minimum and there is no specialization. Turns out though, that there's a very easy answer of how to fix this. And that is by limiting the amount of um, information which you store in that gating network. So we force these primitives to only have a limited amount of responsibility or basically force the system to have a parsimonious alphabet. And well, here you see the difference on this trivial toy task but it is really quite effective when you choose different games related to table tennis, like the game of teleball, where you have this ball in a, on a stick and on a, uh, on a stick, on a string on a stick, where it can wind up in different ways. And there's typically several solutions and they're typically equally good. But if you don't focus and specialize, um, you, you will not get a good solution. So here you see, well, it gets a better performance, but most importantly, it gives us a very, very principled way of reducing the number of primitives quite fastly. So second inductive bias, we should use our uh, modular policy structure for composition and always aim for some form of modular policy structure. Now, Rome wasn't built in a day. So we also need to start with a, part that we need to figure out how to make learning more effective. And one of the easiest ways there is to actually go in terms of task complexity. Now, I don't know why this, okay. Ah, this, okay. So what we, we started out doing is taking tasks like this ball in the cup task and see basically, well, how much actually transfers if you just wanna learn in, in very, very few episodes on a real system and you were well, on a real system, or in this case, you have a simulated system, but we, you can also do this with a, well, we also did this with a real system and you change the, the cup size, which gives you different strategies since um, with a very large cup versus the string length, you get nearly automatic performance with the very short, small ones can be totally different, but um, you, 
can improve your learning performance quite significantly, or your learning speed and learn more behaviors quite, quite easily if you build up such curriculum. Curricula. So again, one important thing, increase your task complexity incrementally. The next two are kind of linked since at some point we will need always need models for that is to, um, um, and obviously it doesn't make sense to use good models when you're doing reinforcement learning, because again, then you can do planning and we can, we could all go home, but um, it's sometimes that, well, you want to do learning with really, really bad models and you want to acquire them from data. When I had just, when I had just been a postdoc and I was, I had started my first own lab, I had this moment that I wanted to do model-based reinforcement learning and I just bought my first robot and I wanted to show performance really, really fast and I had only gotten very, very, very small startup. And I started doing model-based reinforcement learning and what did it do? It, oh, it looked perfect in simulation, looked perfect on the model. And then I ran this um, on the real robot and the first and only thing it did was bang, went into the joint limits, robot broke. So I debugged the whole thing and I looked into it and I figured, I figured out after a while that the model had one serious flaw which it had, the system had learned. Since the model, the model it had learned, the model had the possibility of creating energy by having just at some point the wrong incline despite being super accurate due to regular sometimes when you're using a black box function approximator you can have very high accuracy but the wrong um, sign on the first derivative with the result that the reinforcement learning algorithm had learned oh if i go to this point and i oscillate really fastly i get a lot of energy and then i can do anything i like this happens, by the way, all the time um, up to today, I think still, and whenever people do model-based reinforcement learning, since in the end, these algorithms are made to exploit the errors in your model. So one thing you need to do for that reason is to, if you want to do model-based reinforcement learning, then you need to actually make sure that these models have something to do with the actual physics. And one PhD student of mine actually figured, really figured out two really nice approaches here. In one approach, he basically just kept the basics of Newtonian physics and replaced all the elements of it by, by black box elements and learned one data set from four minutes of motor to babbling and compared this to all the other kinds of models you could learn. So this year was an analytical model inferred with the, with the physical components this was a feed forward neural network. This is an LSTM. And this is this, uh, well, differential Newton Euler uh, based model. And he could show that you can learn ball in the cup from, well, four minutes of data. And with a very high repeatability for a uh, model free approach can make 100%, I should add, but uh, it requires way more data and it requires experimenting on the real system. And what's most interesting, you even get a transferability since you can um, directly transfer the policy to other string lengths within one or two more additional trials, which I found really quite, quite impressive. And Michael really explored this space. And here's a very, very important um, lesson to take. He, he really explored the space between, well, where all of us roboticists have at some point started of really doing good model engineering where, well, when you really want to do this right, you take your robot apart, you really measure all the pieces and we get really good models and including even energy models, such kind of things. And these models typically, well, we typically get them to work, but they also have to require an enormous effort. We know there's a shortcut with system identification. And I think one of the four groups which figured out that this is actually linear in, in the parameters in robotics, but unfortunately non-linear optimization problem was here at MIT with was John Hollerbach and Chris Atkinson and Ann. And um, they, but the problem here is that the parameters are non-linearly coupled. And if you have a high sufficiently high dimensional robot and sufficiently many parasitic non-linearities, is um, system identification, and you need a lot of knowledge addition, actually doesn't give you, it's not so clean, doesn't actually give you a good shot, but unless you really, again, take your robot apart. So this wiggling a robot around and just taking the analytical components results typically to overfitting to, of the data in terms of the physical features we provide. And here, 
the differential Newton Euler was in fact better because it had the components that could actually absorb such things without creating thing, well, cr well, crazy things on the, phys on the parameters, um, which otherwise wouldn't be physically plausible. And Michael also showed that you can even go crazier by taking just Lagrangian mechanics as a prior and um, that that alone would give you a class of neural networks which gives you simulators which are safe against this effect I told you about initially of a black box model that actually learns well something where you can create energy for example so gave you that form of safety and therefore you should never do just black box learning but really stay somewhere between system identification and black box model, uh, between system identification, black box model learning. And I think these two data points really nicely span that space. So that gives us the third inductive bias. If you want to use models in reinforcement learning, they're, they're typically bad since otherwise you would be doing planning. But if you use models in reinforcement learning, then they got to be physically consistent. And well, here are two ways of how you can make sure you're learning physically consistent models. Then, but there's more wrong about training in simulation than just bad models. And I found this very counterintuitive, but when you're training in simulation, you actually encounter some counter this uh, simulation optimization bias, which is even mathematically sound. So even mathematically, you can show that the expect if you do an optimization on a limited number of trajectory is and you compare it to the truly optimal solution that oops, sorry um that you automatically get a bias because this term is always guaranteed to be positive and this even has a good intuition because when the truly optimal solution is here some kind of perturbation in your data will give you once in a while something which will appear better and therefore, you will think that this is the better solution and optimize for that. And so we are basically guaranteed to be wrong. And you need to really, really control for this optimization bias. So this is the tri most trivial control task ever, uh, since it's just balancing a ball on a plate. But the ball is filled with the different things. So the default ball is, is trivial. You learn it within, and well, one trial, maybe at max, X, both the model and the, the system. But then when you um, you know, put in different balls, so like one with paper, with paper clips, with the sand, so that it gets its own weird dynamics, dynamics which you well, don't expect to be. I think the, the craziest was something with oil and stones, which he did. The leakage was annoying. Um, and um, it, the policy, nevertheless, you could learn one policy over this by just controlling the simulation optimization bias properly. And he did a, well, probably did a similar experiment with the pole balancing and different pole length, different weights on it. And it's so that gives us one more inductive bias, oops, the inductive bias of well, controlling our optimization bias. So whenever you use a model, that's one of the next things you really got to do. Then, well, then I don't need to teach any roboticists this, but the fastest way to destroy a robot is to use it. And the, the, among destroying the robot, the even faster way is to do exploration on the system. And in fact, I think the first person to do a reinforcement learning in locomotion was known for the fact that he never got the system to work in quadruped locomotion in Rudiger Dillmann's lab in the 80s. He's, and um, he used well, the earliest Sutton algorithms, but I believe he spent, he created more hours of repair than all other PhD students together of that bunch of Rudiger Dillmann's PhD student. And so therefore, we need to be much safer when we want to do exploration. And here's a lesson again, where I think we can bring something important from an important insight from robotics into the learning problem quite straightforwardly. Since robotics problems typically hide the difficulties in the constraints and not in the reward function. Well, 
95% of the reinforcement learning world runs around and tries to figure out how they can express all the ways they destroy their system in the reward function, put in an, another, another weight on another problem which could potentially arise and which, well, just makes the reward function so, so complex that they don't learn the actual task easily, but instead of, well, learn of actually avoiding these problems in the first hand, by exploring the right kind of constraints. And well, we, so that, oops, that basically brings us the inductive bias that you want to use these constraints to really direct your exploration. And we have been, we have in fact, developed a quite a cool algorithm there um, where we try to use the constraints in order to construct a constraint manifold and then um, determine the right basis of the resulting tangent space. And when you have that, you can basically make sure that all the exploration happens in the tangent space, but you need of course to correct for the curvature of that space and potential errors which have thrown you, you off that constraint manifold. And well, here you see the exploration I have to add, uh, this is one of, is, is a big hierarchy table. So it's very easy to do hierarchy on a small table when you just do basically linear motion. On the big table, you, uh, with the KUKA arm, this is not an easy task. Um, and we've only destroyed one table during exploration ever. And it was even fixable with a PhD student and a little bit of glue. Uh, so um, they're really very thin. Once you punch, you punch through. Here you see the performance and simulation, and here you see all the different tasks, which, um, well, all the different tasks, which as of actually, yeah, as of eight weeks ago, we had done. I like particularly this um, dynamic hitting one, since um, that's something I think I'll be very few humans can do, uh, hitting it against the sides and then pushing to it. Nope. Pusa has actually started a competition on this. And um, I, I forgot to add this to the slide, but he would any of you interested in doing air hockey, you can actually submit, you can actually use a simulator to submit your own solutions to it. And the top three people doing their solutions, well, first of all, we have funding of Huawei to give them an award. And secondly, we, um, we want them to run their real solution then on the real robot. And that's gonna be, well, hopefully fun and hopefully enough incentive to get also some of you to participate. So, yes. So in this case, we're training on the real world, but we have also done, you can also do sim to real in this one. I wouldn't totally trust the sim to real, but the, um, since you, you, so the problem when you're hitting two round things onto each other is that a very, very tiny error actually makes a gigantic difference in angle. So two, two, millim two millimeters, this difference can mean 90 degrees um, difference in direction. And that's why sim to real is actually quite hard here. Yeah, so you'd always need to have some training on the real system in the end. But pre-training and simulation is, is obviously something you want to, to do once in a while to see how much you can speed it up by that. And um, Pusa has really been exploring this to the extreme. This, this is also one of the reasons why we're running this competition, because we think it would be kind of cool now to see whether, whether Pusa has overlooked anything. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yes, so th that is a very good question. So that we have to actually put in as prior knowledge. So you either put this in the reward function or you actually have um, try to have the physical constraints in some form. Um, and um, but that doesn't need to be that case. So we have a we have a constraint learning algorithm where you would um, where you would do could do this for where you do this by supervised learning, and it's relatively easy to to get the constraints by supervised learning. And there have also been much earlier works on just learning constraints um, by supervised learning on which you could build if you don't want to build on, on our version there. So, but I, I, yeah, I strongly recommend whenever you have some, you can, you know, beforehand and then also use them right away. So, and finally, well, whenever you're learning a sport, one of the, one of the first things your teachers tell you, like when you learn how to ski, let your body go with the flow. And I think 
that's that's something where in robotics we've been handicapped by the problem that between intelligence on the one side and mechanical engineers on the other side, there's always been this nasty control engineer in the middle um, who has been telling us, no, 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 no. Uh, you AI people only give me a desired trajectory and you mechanical engineering people, you only build me what I can control. And I think reducing that role um, it's one of it's probably the one of the most important things to do, which is obviously a super pain for the mechanical engineers because they have to actually trust in the AI people being able to control what he builds. On the one hand, he can finally build what he wants to build. Um, and well, we we when we did table tennis, we hit three major problems. One major problem was the well, the selection of whether you could actually make it and predict from the human, whether you could do forehands and backhands. That one we could solve by AI. Another problem was that humans are so incredibly good by just sidestepping, right? Same movement again, again. Um, you have way fewer movements you need to learn as a human that you could maybe solve by linear access or a mobile base. Um, we didn't touch it. Um, the Google people touched it apparently last year. Um, and it, it really ma does make a difference. You need way fewer kinds of movements which you can train better. And finally, well, the human accelerations are just so amazing, right? Um, try to play table tennis as a bared whim. That means move a two kilogram wrist, being nailed to the ceiling. Um, not so trivial, not so trivial at all. And well, we, so we decided to actually do one thing I do very rarely, but um, to build actually a robot. And we wanted to build it among the very, very simple principles. So we said we want to have a strong actuator for high accelerations and also small moving masses for, again, high accelerations. And also for, well, safety, because we really want to, don't want to damage the robot so that it can hit against the table tennis table without damaging itself and um, that we can walk out of the room for learning and um, build it for well the performance of table tennis and for learning, but definitely not for feedback control. And we had a very, very famous control engineer um, in our lab and he looked at this and he said something, I quote, um, don't be offended, but he said, this is a computer scientist wet dream, but a control engineer's nightmare. Um, and well, nevertheless, so here you see, so we start an initial policy, which is nothing but motor babbling. So we send some stiffness, some equilibrium point to the muscles base in, basically by sending a certain desired pressure and a, um, at a certain gains onto the pressure onto the muscles. And we give it a simulated ball initially for 14 hours and let it for 14 hours just return the simulated ball. So you should see the simulated ball somewhere on, on the screen always. And I should add that ball coming is actually a real ball just recorded. Many of you had recorded a big data set there and we're replaying them. And then we're simulating the ball to record contact and then we're returning them. And after another 30 minutes, so you can actually walk out of the room, let it train and after 14 hours, it has a good policy. And um, if you additionally do a little bit on real system training, you actually get um, so far our nicest um, table tennis behavior in terms of high accelerations and can also do all kinds of smashes and forehands. So with other words, another important inductive bias is let your natural dynamics of your robots really guide your learning process. A lot of topics profit from this since we are obviously not just about robot learning, but we are quite interested in why humans are so amazing and what can we actually tell with our methods about humans we're quite interested in well, making robotics better. We're quite interested in machine learning and development. And, um, and sadly, the funding system has really made us explore, well, sadly or greatly made us explore a lot of things. Um, so our imitation learning runs in the Porsche uh, human race car driver simulator by now and is, is used there to test that simulator. We've been doing all kinds of um, semi-autonomy working a bit on prosthetics with these things. And we've helped solve a conundrum about human ball catching using these methods. We obviously develop way, way more machine learning approaches. Yes, and well, we have, we work on, well, 
I guess uh, we work a lot on tactile robotics, robot graphics manipulation, do way more work in to real or how to do stability proofs, all of that. With that, I am at my conclusion. Use please at least these seven inductive biases from this talk and thank you for your attention. We have time for questions. So, I mean, so the, the, the question is basically about policy classes and how much they can create inductive biases. So one thing, for example, we worked on for a very long time is that we took this optimization problem from the beginning to um, actually and just put in minimal physics in order to get policy classes which can represent, well, precisely the kind of behaviors a robot can actually execute. And that makes already a huge difference since if you would just take a you know an off-the-shelf deep neural network you can you most of the outputs are not a not a policy that um, is in any way compliant with the um, with the natural dynamics of your system that it will create motor torques which you have to filter out in order to not destroy the motors and all kinds of things which is well totally different if you you derive your policy class right away from a minimal amount of knowledge on the physics of your system. Okay. Yes, Thomas. So this is a, a parallel question. Mm -hmm. uh, so what's your inductive bias from which tasks you should address with the Oh. So that's a very good question. Which tasks should we really do by reinforcement learning? I think there's two types of tasks where reinforcement learning in, makes sense. Um, one task is when you have very, very, very few observations and you and they are very noisy, see, because um, and you well can't get uh, can't get a very good model based answer. So, for example, if you try to play table tennis with the industrial cameras like we had there, this is um, this is a typical scenario where this makes a lot of sense. And since then, you're creating very robust policies, and these robust policies are better than things you would create if you had, like, I don't know, perfect sensing, for example. Also, high speed, few frames, noisy frames is one of the settings. The second setting, I think, is whenever you frequently break and make and break contact with the environment um, in a way that you cannot control the contact. So if something is, is, is stay, if, if, if there's something stays where it is, when I touch it, then obviously you don't need reinforcement learning. Again, you can do this with a geometry based planning much better. And then you do a little bit of impedance control and you're done um, or force control, depending on, on the task. While if you if you have something which could either rapidly slide away or stay wherever it is, and um, you have no clue about the hysteresis, about the um, the impact model, then or the impact model changes all the time, then again, I think is the point where we should be doing a reinforcement learning thing. And I think these these are the two biggest classes, uh, since there in both cases we have a hard time with it when we would go for just for planning. But you should also avoid reinforcement learning at all costs when you can do planning. And um, I think if we somehow our pendulum has gone from don't do learning at all, but the people told me at DLR as an undergraduate student um, to, oh, we should only do learning. And I think this is, we need to be in the middle somewhere. And the inductive biases help us to make learning on the real system in real time possible. And, but if you can, obviously, we should always bring in more knowledge. And also planning can be a good starting for, um, can be a very, very good start for a reinforcement learning algorithm so that we, um, if we don't know enough about the system. You mentioned the into the control. Uh, conversely, uh, you know, today we have things like, 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 like,
which mm -hmm. is to master language without mastering motion, right? So, so in other words, very different from what biological systems Apart from the modularity, we are probably things in your work inspired by biology. Oh, we we have we've looked at huh? we've looked a, we've been quite interested in in back, going back and forth between biology and uh, bio, both biological applications like brain robot interfaces as well as at modeling how humans actually learn their motor tasks and then see whether we can bring insights from that over or also in the opposite direction. So for, for me, ball catching is one of the most fascinating scenarios because you you very Brought, brought ideas the other direction because is there you have two schools of, of scientists who are not in agreement. You have neuroscientists who say humans learn very good models and use these models very smartly. And you have um, psychologists who basically say humans are quite dumb. They only have a bag of tricks, which makes them appear intelligent. And um, so couldn't be more extreme, right? The two viewpoints. And they take the outfielder and baseball as in typically as one of their 10 typical examples. And the outfielder and baseball does something very counterintuitive. When you throw him a ball, he will look at the ball and he will center it on the retina and then he will, walk, will run backwards, which, um, which basically, well, gives him a very robust policy. So one of the tricks out of the back of tricks well, the neuroscientist will say, oh, well, but if I throw something from here to pull it, then he, he will be able to catch it. And he can only do this because he has a very good forward model and can predict where the ball is will be going. It turns out that both are instantiations of the same program, for example, that it is all about, in the end, two variables only, since it's only about whether how the ratio between your the speed of your uh, of your arm versus the time to contact and the noise of your odometry um, versus the noise of your observations, and you can actually derive it from the same. Um, well, you can derive it from the same reward function. You can obtain both behaviors. We could even predict human behavior, which wasn't in the literature. Um, it required a professional baseball gun and um, two drones tracking the humans, but uh, we could show that there are multiple turn behaviors um, if you have sufficient distance and um, or introduce different noise levels. And um, so that it works. That's actually something where I think a back and forth is a really, really interesting thing between both how humans do it, do things, and well, also what lights we can shed onto humans. Great. So unfortunately, we're out of time. You know, but if you have more questions, please come up to Jan and you can ask more questions. So mm -hmm. let's thank also Tao Chen who helped organize the seminar and Jan once again. Mm-hmm. <laughs>